different systems, setting up a home studio, and uh, we now do uh, a lot of online talks, so like this one, but we also set up a whole live stream system so we can uh, do a YouTube channel for kids. Also a lot for teachers that are just uh, uh, drastically looking for content for their classes and everything, which I normally do much more, I don't know, as a nice to have, but now I really feel like it's, it's something we can do as Tony's because we don't want to communicate too much at the moment either. Right? We don't do any marketing activities at all. We've not done any social media activities for the last two weeks. Uh, slightly now starting up again, just telling people why we haven't been communicating and how we're working in our value chain with the Corona crisis. But no fun stuff because everything is a bit touchy. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a switch. Everybody working from home, uh, stores closed. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, but at the same time, there's people that are being hit much harder than we are. Um, because yes, we see sales dropping, but some companies see sales dropping to zero. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we still see people uh, uh, buying chocolate for uh, for themselves. Our online sales have tripled because everybody's buying it directly from our web store. So, but it's, uh, yeah, we'll see. It's too early uh, to see the impact. For me personally, I like to, I like to see this as a reset for, for the capitalist system, for the world, for society. And I see a lot of, uh, incredibly uh, uh, unifying activities by people as well, left and right, which which okay. makes me really happy. I see a lot of entrepreneurs pivoting towards new business models, which is really inspiring to me as an entrepreneur as a whole. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of downsides, but we can all uh, uh, be very pessimistic and only look at the downsides. I tend to look at the few upsides we can find in there and, and they are there, there. so uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, interesting, actually. And I think that will be some of the discussion we are going to have together today, uh, definitely. Um, and so it's almost time. I think I would propose that we uh, we get started. Um, okay, cool. And I uh, would like to welcome everybody uh, that's uh, in the call now. Uh, so we will be around, the, as I mentioned to you, 2025. Right? It's, it's uh, the group that we have for this uh, module on sustainability and systemic change uh, so we will discuss you will present to us for 25 to 30 minutes and then we will have a round of questions people are prepared so they have prepared questions for you already um, so i think there will be a flow of questions afterwards um, i will take them most of them in the uh, chat box and uh, feed them back to you just to try to keep this a bit organized and at one point i suppose it will be free flow but we'll start like this um, yeah, that's good. And it's also perfect for me. I mean, we, we're using this is for me the first time I'm doing this through Teams. Yeah. So bear with me as well. Um, up to now, in the last two weeks, I've been using a, a YouTube live stream. Yeah. Uh, and that really only had a chat box, but we also have face to face opportunity here. So I'm fine with not dropping the questions in the chat box, but posing them directly uh, to me. Uh, we see sure. whether that works. Okay. <laughs> well, let's give it a try. And um... Yeah, and usually we have you either uh, at May or the on campus, or we go actually to your store in Amsterdam, which yeah. definitely the experience is slightly different. But uh, we'll do our best under the circumstances. I'm very happy to have you here uh, today, Enzo. Um, cool, yes. No, very be happy to be here again, uh, even though it's uh, not in person, but it's, uh, I, see, I see some people on my screen, so it's more personal <laughs> than the live stream so far. Okay. I've uh, I've got a little uh, presentation which is a bit of a trimmed down version of uh, uh, my usual one, and I've taken out the movies because I don't know how that works through Teams or whether that works properly. But also to try to keep it as compressed as possible, uh, yeah. so we have more time at the end uh, for Q and A, which uh, I uh, uh, at the moment draw so much more energy from being. Uh, Locked down at home, so it's great to have uh, see some people at least uh, through my screen, and not just my kids and my wife. You know, you get really bored with your kids and your wife within two weeks' time. I can tell. Anyway, uh, uh, I hope we will bring you some fun, Enzo. Yeah, so let's. Uh, I won't give you the floor. I'll give you the screen, and um, it's up to you. Perfect. So let's see how this works and whether this works fine. And so if I can click, yes, okay. You see slides clicking now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> let me hit you with my waterfall um, of, uh, of chocolate talk. Um, 
for the people that have no idea just tuning in uh, in their pajamas from home. Uh, my name is Inzo and I'm the chief evangelist or the Shoko evangelist of uh, Tony's Chuckle Only. And for the people not familiar with Tony's, I would say it's a, a formerly small Dutch chocolate company uh, trying to make a difference uh, in the world. Do me a favor, uh, guys, mute from your end. Uh, for those people that are, have a slight cold, then the sniff doesn't go through the whole uh, internet. Uh, we don't get uh, 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 Corona on this side of the pipeline. Um, so uh, I'll tell you today about uh, what we do as a company, about how we do things as a company, but most importantly, why we even came to be as a company, a bit of the history, a bit of the background of Tony's, uh, but also a bit of a rundown on cocoa and the cocoa industry as a whole. Um, and the bitter reality that still exists in the cocoa industry today, which has to do with, uh, unfortunately, a huge amount of forced child labor in that value chain. So I'll tell you all about it. And then um, if I try to keep my rambling to the minimum possible, we have loads of time afterwards. So how does the value chain of uh, cocoa look? Cocoa grows around the equator. There's a bit of cocoa that comes from Asia. There's a bit of cocoa that comes from South America, where originally all cocoa comes from. But the majority of all cocoa nowadays grows uh, uh, in Western Africa on millions of tiny farms. So these are not a huge plantations that you might have imagined in your life before. But these are one, two, three, maximum four hectare size family run businesses. And unfortunately, more and more of them, honestly. So economies of scale uh, uh, aren't there in uh, Ivory Coast in Ghana. Um, and one side of the value chain. The other side of the value chain are billions of consumers like, well, you and I who just want to be able to munch down on a big bar of chocolate every single day in your life without having to sense any uh, guilt uh, uh, during that, uh, doing that. In the middle of that value chain, that is where the problem exists because it's like an hourglass model because there's only a handful of companies that actually produce chocolate from cocoa. I would say not much more than eight to 10 companies produce about 85 to 90 percent of all chocolate in the whole wide world. So these are the big industrials like Calibo or Cargill and the better known brand names like uh, Mars, uh, Nestle, Hershey's, Mondelez, former Kraft Foods, uh, Meiji. Uh, and it's in their interest that the price of cocoa remains low. In our opinion, that price is inhumanly low. So how does that look of a bar of uh, chocolate that's sold in the stores in Holland for, say, on average, two euros 80. Not much more than 15 or 16 cents actually goes to the farmer that grows that cocoa. Uh, to put that, uh, that's about five and a half to six percent of the retail price. Um, and uh, that leads to the typical cocoa farmer in Ivory Coast and their family members living of about uh, 72 euro cents per person available income per day. 72 euro cents for the smart people on the other side of the line is uh, not even a third of the uh, uh, living income uh, level that's stated at two euros and 40 for Ivory Coast, let alone the extreme poverty line, which is stated at one euros and 79 per person per day in Ivory Coast. So it is it is an, an unworkable and utterly unequally divided value chain, I would say. Um, now, let me click through. There's two countries in Ivory Coast that produce, uh, two countries in Western Africa, Ivory Coast and Ghana, that produce 60% of all cocoa in the whole wide world. And that's grown on about two and a half million farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast alone. And I say about because they don't happily skip to the Chamber of Commerce to enlist themselves as a business. Uh, but Tulane University does research on this uh, regularly. And their last report was two and a half million cocoa farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast alone. And on those farms, there's 2.3 million children that work there of which 90% work under illegal circumstances. So that means that these kids work with heavy machinery, work with chemicals, work with um, or walk around with big, sharp machetes. Uh, and uh, for example, at the age of six, seven, eight years old, uh, go around carrying bags of cocoa beans that weigh 60 kilos per bag. And it's very important to know that this is not just illegal according to international labor organization standards, but also illegal according to local law in Ivory Coast and Ghana. 
And at least 30,000 children are subject to something that we call modern slavery. So these are kids that do unpaid forced labor outside of the family environment, um, are lured from neighboring countries like Burkina Faso under false pretenses, like uh, we're going to educate you to become a cocoa farmer, you'll be able to send home some money, etc. These, these kids sometimes disappear in that industry. Now, in 2001, there were two American centers, uh, senators called Harkin and Engel that set up the Harkin and Engel Protocol, which was meant to eradicate the worst forms of forced child labor from the value chain of cocoa within five years' time. And the Harkin and Engel Protocol was signed by all of the CEOs of the big chocolate companies that I just mentioned. And then you think you're there, hit, hit it on the head, fix it. Unfortunately, the Harkin and Engel Protocol was and is a so-called non-binding agreement. And I can tell you non-binding agreements don't get you anywhere. And it shows because now almost 20 years down the line, none of the goals in the Harkin and Engel Protocol have been achieved. None of the big chocolate firms are actually taking up the responsibility of fixing their own systems and nothing has changed. Five years after signing the Harkin and Engel Protocol, there was a Dutch television show called Keuringsdienst van Waarde. And for the people that don't know it, it's like an investigative journalistic program looking at the reality behind, let me put this in blunt Dutch, some bullshit of food marketing that goes around. Uh, and the journalist, Teun van de Keuken, was shocked when he realized that nothing had changed. Almost at the end of the first term, five-year term of the Harkin and Engel Protocol, nothing had changed in the cocoa industry. Even worse, nothing had been done towards change in the industry. So it was just a fake. Uh, but turn, uh, well, you, you know, the uh, the average Dutch guy uh, gets quickly uh, angry really quickly. Uh, and turn is like an exponential version of the average Dutch guy. So turn was utterly sh uh, pissed off when none of these players wanted to speak to him on camera. Um, and there's a lovely part of that in our documentary that you can see where Tone gets angry outside of the gates of Barry Kalabout, where they didn't want to speak to him. Kalabout, that is now one of our biggest partners to do, to do this with, honestly. So Tone, uh, because none of these people wanted to speak to him, so he didn't have the footage to make a proper television show, came up with a smart move. And Tone bought 10 different bars of different brands of chocolate, which he was sure that somewhere in the value chain had been forced child labor. And he put a camera on himself, and he took a bite of each and every of those bars and he called the international alarm number 112 and he said, hello, my name is Teun van der Keuk and I want to turn myself in as a chocolate criminal. Now, you can imagine it was a bit quiet on the other end of the line because they don't get these, these phone calls every day. Uh, and the lady said, uh, excuse me, sir, why? And he said, well, according to international law, if you're aware of criminal activities in the value chain of a product that you buy, you make yourself complicit to those criminal activities. Tone actually used the analogy. He said, if at the end of the afternoon in a shady park in Amsterdam, I buy a ridiculously cheap secondhand bicycle from a guy that doesn't smell too well, I can rest assured I'm not buying a legal secondhand bicycle. I'm buying a stolen bicycle and I make myself responsible, complicit to the theft of that bicycle. It's called fencing in English, hailing in Dutch. And so by buying and consuming chocolate of which I know or so reason turn on the phone, of which I know that there's forced child labor in that value chain, I make myself complicit to financing modern slavery. And that's illegal, so you have to come and arrest me. Now, you can probably imagine Turn was still not being taken seriously. The lady actually hung up the phone. Uh, and Turn hired an expensive lawyer and had a court case set up against himself. Now, that was a first for that lawyer who was normally asked to get people out of prison, and in this case, prosecute somebody into prison. Um, but it was a brilliant move by Tone, because if Tone, working for a small production company, would have sued any of these big chocolate players, he probably even wouldn't get to a court case, right? He'd have a platoon of lawyers on his doorstep the next day, and they would wait it out and test his patience. And in this case, they could only watch and stand by and see what the verdict of the judge would be. They would, they would have to abide by that verdict. Now, unfortunately, after a lengthy pretrial, the judge said, uh, Mr. Van de Keuken, uh, Mr. from the kitchen, um, morally, you're completely right. But legally, I can't prosecute you because I can't prove the causality, the direct relationship between the bars that you ate and the beans that were picked by uh, Co Hermann, a, a former child slave who was flown in as a witness in that court case. 
And then we realized something that still up to today, very few people know that if you buy a 100% fair trade bar of chocolate, you cannot rest assured that there's 100% fair trade cocoa beans processed in that bar of chocolate. Because cocoa is and has always been a so-called mass balanced product. So all cocoa beans, certified or not, are thrown on a big heap, uh, the world market. And from the back end of the world market, the uh, cocoa or the chocolate producers buy their cocoa beans. And that's convenient for them because if you then ask them, is there any forced child labor in your value change, uh, chains, they will say, we don't know because we don't know where the beans come from. That is how the system works. Now, if you tell a guy like Dave van der Keuken, that is how the system works. And I just explained how easily uh, Dutch people get angry and how Tone is an uh, extension of that. Uh, then you get turned really on the, on the barricades and turn said, you know, fuck that system. I'll, ch I'll change the system from within. And he started his own little chocolate company called Tony's Chocolate Only. Tony's, the international name for Tone, which is unpronounceable for the average uh, foreigner, uh, and Chocolate Lonely for his lonely battle in the chocolate industry. Hence the unpronounceable brand name that we still go by today. Uh, and everybody on the other end of the line is excused for having pronounced Tony Chocolonely wrong over the last 15 years. I would say 50, I would say 80% of the Dutch always talk about Tony Chocolonely, uh, and, and it can be even worse because last year I was once introduced at a conference as Inzo from Toco Chocoloco. I'm like, okay, that dude could have done his homework a bit better, but anyway. Tony's Chocolate Only was born, a small chocolate company, but with a huge mission to not only make our own chocolate 100% slave free, but to make all chocolate worldwide 100% slave free. We had uh, 5,000 bars made thinking we could run a proper grown up company with a stock of 5,000 bars. We had no idea how any business worked because, I mean, we came from a journalistic background. Uh, in the, in the first morning that we launched, we sold and pre-sold more than 13,000 bars. So we were out of our stock within an hour's time. Um, and uh, we obviously hit a nerve with the Dutch consumer that was uh, longing for a product to indulge themselves while still being able to do something good for the world and society around them, honestly. So some uh, expensive consultants might call that a latent consumer demand uh, we just uh, figured uh, people were looking for a nice chocolate bar. And for the people uh, that are uh, that are well that are familiar with the coloring of our bars, we had the first 5,000 chocolate bars wrapped in an alarming color, red, uh, because Tone had no idea about the Dutch chocolate culture, where red is always the packaging for dark chocolate. So that was an utter mindfuck for the average Dutch consumer. And when we became a more serious chocolate company, we put our dark chocolate in a blue wrapper to extend that mindfuck to the average consumer. So people now really have to read the bars before they know what's in it. And it's even still now with our Easter eggs, our dark eggs are in, in a little blue aluminum foil. People are going crazy for that again. They, they just don't get it. Anyway, that's the average Dutch consumer for you. So uh, small Dutch co uh, chocolate company was born, 2005, which mission that I just talked about. Now, um, here's a little stat of our growth in market share over the last eight years, and I can even extend it. It's over 20% now at the moment. So we became market leaders in the Netherlands in a very short time frame in chocolate, and we're now available in uh, Scandinavia, Finland, Germany, Belgium, France, UK, US, uh, and some exotic places like Dubai, Taipei, Mexico, um, so intergalactically available in a, in a short term of, uh, frame of time, I think. Um, and even though we became market leaders uh, so quickly, uh, and we're now with a team of about 160 people, we still really cling on to uh, the company culture of a small company, whether it's a, you want to call it a startup or a scale up, because uh, we really think that that small companies are, are able to make a big change in the world. Now, how do we think we can create that change? How do we think we can work towards 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide? The very first step in that strategy is to simply create awareness amongst chocolate consumers about the bitter reality that still exists in the chocolate industry today. Because we're convinced that when consumers and retailers simply hand in hand ask more questions 
about what they put in their shopping baskets or what they put up on their shelves, that the producers of these goods will have to start feel the pressure and will have to change their ways. Now, how do we find those active consumers that can help us make that change? We call those people our serious friends. And those are the people that not just buy our chocolate because they like our chocolate, not just buy our chocolate because they like our mission, but those people that actively spread that mission amongst friends and family. And I'll get back to later on why that is so relevant for us. Now, how do we find those serious friends? Well, for example, two years ago, we opened a little store in the heart of Amsterdam, in the Burst van Berlage in Amsterdam, um, uh, where we installed a machine slightly illegal because it's a historical building and the machine was one meter bigger than the room we actually rented so we had to break through a wall there which we didn't tell anybody um uh, but if you ever think you've tried all bars of tony's that are available think again and go to our stores once they open up again after the corona crisis because with that machine you can make more than 22,000 different combinations of chocolate bars yourself you can put your own ingredients in there different types of chocolate etc and some people call this a very commercial enterprise, which is fine by me because we're commercial as hell. Don't get me wrong. I'll explain later on maybe why differently commercial than other companies, but still. But those people forget the beautiful historical fact that our store is located literally two floors down from the place where for hundreds of years cocoa beans had been traded because the Burs van Berlach in Amsterdam was and is the first stock exchange ever in the whole wide world. And we love that historical context. Now, that store wasn't crazy enough for us yet. So last year we announced we want to open our own factory. And we bought the building. It's on the outskirts of Amsterdam in Zaandam in the Zaan area. And again, the historical context is so nice because the Zaan area is where chocolate used to be made in Holland. Uh, and we bring back chocolate into that historical part. We bought the building already. Um, and that factory, we're going to move there as an office as well next year. That factory isn't just meant to make chocolate. It's meant to spread that story. So we're aiming to get half a million people to that factory per year. How do you get half a million people to a boring factory? We asked our most trusted advisors, and those are our own kids. And they said, Dad, maybe if you have a roller coaster to go through your factory, then you're going to get half a million people to your factory. So we're actually literally building a roller coaster going through our factories. Hopefully it's also going through our office at the end, but that's still slightly health and safety hazardous. So we'll see whether you can make that happen. Um, but it's there to create awareness. And why do we want to create this awareness? Not just to sell, sell chocolate. At this moment, we're really focused on upping the pressure on the governments of all EU member states and the government of the US to really make sure that there's laws in place, but also those laws are enforced to make sure that organizations legally take their responsibility for any form of human rights violations in their value chain and that they can prove that they aren't there. So no forced child labor at all. So we're actually now uh, launching a petition, uh, which is in a bit of a soft launch because of the Corona crisis, to get 1 million signatures from consumers and those serious friends to up that pressure on the EU and the US. Now, second step in our strategy is that we want to show the industry that chocolate can be made in a different way in a more social way, in a more sustainable way, in our opinion, simply in a better way. How? By following a five-step recipe for slave-free cocoa that the same uh, expensive consultants would probably call sourcing principles. So here they are. Number one is to take responsibility for your full value chain. So in our case, that means bean to bar responsibility. So we can actually trace our cocoa beans fully back to the farmer that delivered cocoa beans to the cooperatives that we work with. We now work with seven cooperatives in Ghana and Ivory Coast with more than 6,638 farmers in those two countries. And why Ghana and Ivory Coast? Because that is where the problem with the forced child labor is the biggest. So instead of going around the problem by sourcing our beans from places like South America, we really want to change that system in Ghana and Ivory Coast locally. Why is that direct and long-term relationship so important? Because then we can pay a higher price directly to those farmers. So on top of the farm gate price, we pay the 20% fair trade premium. And on top of that, we pay another additional Tony's premium of about 20 to 50% to get these farmers towards the living income reference price, which we think that any chocolate producer should be paying these farmers. We established that price last year together with fair trade. Um, and a living income, in my opinion, doesn't mean much different than that you're able as a farmer to have a roof over your head 
uh, feed your whole family, send your kids to school, which we find essential, and hopefully invest a little bit in your farm to get into a positive vicious spiral upwards. So we help them increase their productivity, we help them uh, increase the quality of their cocoa beans. Uh, and lastly, we help these cooperatives to have a stronger stand through financial management training and support by NGOs on the ground, a stronger stand towards those buyers in that hourglass value chain model that, that I described earlier. Now, the last step in our strategy is that we want other organizations and we want to inspire other organizations to copy our business model and hopefully even improve on our business model. Last year, we had really good news that now all private label Albert Heijn chocolates, so all Delicata chocolate, and Albert Heijn is the biggest retailer in the Netherlands, um, is now sourced through the same five principles that I just described. And why was that such great news? Because the Albert Heijn chocolate and our chocolate is both made by Barry Kalabaut. And by uh, combining those two volumes, Barry Kalabaut now reaches a volume that they can roll this out to any brand that they make it for. Why is that so relevant? Because Barry Kalabaut simply is the biggest chocolate producer in the whole wide world. And if they can do it, there's no excuse for anybody else to say we can't do it. Um, now, we could have become an NGO. We could have become an activist. We chose to become a commercial chocolate brand, changing that system from within. Some people might call us a social enterprise, which on the one hand I find fine because for us, financial success isn't a goal. Financial success don't get us wrong, we're commercial as hell, but financial success is a means towards a goal. The goal for us is crystal clear. It's 100% slave-free chocolate worldwide. But I'm starting to oppose more and more calling ourselves or even being called a social enterprise because I'm starting to see that people then uh, see you as if you're in this niche of philanthropy businesses. And, and I actually want to show regular mainstream entrepreneurship that when you're financially successful, you simply have a moral obligation towards the society and planet around you. And now more than ever in these times, I would say, uh, to do something good with your financial success and do something good for that society and planet around you. So I would say regular entrepreneurs have just been slightly confused over the last two, three generations. And we should move back to a system where entrepreneurship in itself is social in its core. We can discuss later on again. Um, so we always say we're crazy about chocolate, but we're serious about people. Now we're pretty damn crazy about chocolate, right? I mean, 15 years ago in Holland, you had four types of chocolate, white, milk, dark, and something with nuts sprinkled into it. We have about 25 to 30 different recipes at the moment. I don't know whether you tasted our uh, our Easter egg bar already with, with uh, marzipan and nuts. it's just crack cocaine to a choco junkie like me. Uh, I don't have one on my desk because I will finish it in two and a half minutes. And that's about two and a half hours of cycling to get rid of the same 1100 calories again. So anyway, crazy about chocolate. If you walk into our office, uh, any of our offices, once, once they are open again, the first thing you always see is that kitchen where Ava and Celine come up with the craziest recipes every day. So we're crazy about chocolate, but we're serious about people. And in our list of serious about people, number one, which is slightly narcissistic, but we put our own team because we're convinced that we can only reach that humongous goal of 100% slavery chocolate worldwide with the most committed and engaged and inspired team you can imagine. So even though we work our asses off on a very serious subject, we try to make that work as fun as possible. So our whole office radiates the fun factor of uh, Tony's. Our workplaces need to be amazing. We have the most amazing uh, vegetarian lunches made by a cook in our office because we have a saying that the lunch in our office needs to be better than what you can get when you work or when you go out for food on the Westergas area in Amsterdam. Um, in our contracts, it specifically states that you can bring home as much chocolate from the office as you can physically carry each and every single day. And to keep that slightly uh, within reality boundaries, we have free running shoes paid by the boss every year. We have yoga classes. We have boot camp classes. Do you guys know what a BMI is, a body mass index? So we used to have a BMI bonus, which obviously became slightly politically incorrect after a certain while. So we changed that into the 
maintain your BMI bonus. So at least your relative BMI hasn't increased that year due to all the free chocolate that you get to munch down on at home. Uh, and I have, when I was uh, head of people and culture, as we call it, because I hate the term HR. So when I became the head of HR, I immediately turned that into people and culture, which is much more what it's about, right? Because if you turn humans into resources, I don't think you understand what proper, uh, uh, proper entrepreneurship is about. So when I became head of people and culture, we said, you know what, if you work with uh, so many people on a, on a grown up level and you are friends and you're inter interdependent constantly in your job, isn't it weird that you have a fixed amount of holidays if you just expect people to get that job done? So we turned that into unlimited holidays. And then somebody in my team said, nah, but that's a bit techy, right? Unlimited holidays. So we turned that around. We made it very tony. We said, you know, instead of having maximum 28 holidays, we're moving to minimum 28 holidays. So managers are actually held accountable for their team members being away for at least 28 days per year. We have one more. We have a baby bonus at Tony's because not every employer likes it when you become pregnant, right? Because you're gone for a while. At Tony's, we applaud it. So if you have a child whilst working at Tony's, on the day of birth, you get a thousand euros cash in your hands. And if you make a child with somebody else within Tony's, you each get a thousand euros cash in your hands. And that seriously, uh, if you then call your child Tony, you get another thousand euros cash in your hands. So it's a business model to make Tony's at Tony's with Tony's during work time. It gives a totally different twist to the Friday afternoon drinks, I can tell you. Anyway, so obviously on number one, our own team. On number two should be obvious as well, the more than six and a half thousand farmers that we build these long-term relationships with. And before I start sounding like some kind of marketing boquito, bear in mind, six and a half thousand farmers isn't half percent yet of the more than two and a half million farms that we need to reach in Ghana and Ivory Coast alone. So we are a drop in the ocean, unfortunately, but we're getting there and moving towards a more equally divided world. Number three, consumers. Number four, the retailers that sell our bars. So those are all the retailers in the Netherlands. It's Sainsbury's and, and, and Whole Foods in the UK and the US. Uh, it's uh, uh, good news, Carrefour pretty soon. It's Delhaix in Belgium, et cetera, et cetera. Number five, our suppliers. So Barry Calabat, who makes our chocolate, we often say we're not a chocolate maker, we're an impact maker through the way of chocolate. Calabat makes our chocolate. Anyway, wrapping up this story. If you hear this story about how unequally divided the world of cocoa is, it's weird to realize that for the last uh, centuries, uh, chocolate bars always had this perfectly equally divided shape, right? Almost Excel spreadsheet kind of boring. And I won't mention any uh, brand names, but some chocolate manufacturers, and they tend to believe in purple cows, even put their brand name on each and every individual block, just in case a consumer might forget halfway through the bar what brand of bar he or she had been munching all, the, all that time. Now, we thought that was a bit boring, so we made our bars unequally divided. And I can tell you, in the beginning, we had hell to pay. The phone was ringing off the hook. The in inbox was full of complaints. And uh, the most epic complaint was by this mother who sent us an email saying, my kids used to live in perfect harmony and you fuckers come up with this unequally divided chocolate bars and there's kids bickering in my home all day now. And I speak from my own experience. I was two kids now bored out, out of their heads downstairs with a six and a half hour limit PlayStation time nowadays, more or less. Anyway, so we tried to get in touch with each and everybody of these people that had a complaint to explain why we had made our bars unequally divided. Because our bars tell the story of the unequally divided chocolate industry in its purest form. Our bars actually become a discussion piece. If you open a bar of Tony's at the dinner table with somebody next to you that doesn't know this story, you're going to have to explain this story because they will ask you, why is that thing so annoyingly unequally divided? Now, why is that relevant? Because we have never paid a single cent to paid media. So we became market leaders and are available worldwide without paying a single cent in advertising or commercials ever. It's all been word of mouth through our brand ambassadors uh, and slightly different way of marketing, I think. Now, not too many people know that we managed to hide the map of Western Africa in our bars, showing the uh, origin of the cocoa beans and the pride that we have of the strong farmers 
that we work with in Ghana and Ivory Coast. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is in a slightly extended nutshell how we think a small company can make a huge dent in a rusted down industry because we are convinced that by ourselves we can make our chocolate 100 percent slave free but only together with the rest of the industry with the cocoa farmers with governments with uh, the serious friends that we collect and the retailers can we actually make sure that all chocolate worldwide becomes 100 percent slave free now i'm going to leave you before we do a uh, in uh, hours long q a which i'm up for I'm going to leave you with a wise say from a wise French dude, Jean-Paul Sartre, who once said, once you know something and you're aware, you're responsible. And when you're responsible, it's upon you to act upon that responsibility. So the very next time you find yourself in front of the chocolate shelf, which is so strategically placed at the end of your shopping or any shelf for that matter, or to the smart people on the other side of this line, I would say any business decision you might find yourself in front of, just realize that each and every purchase and each and every decision you make in your life is a vote for the world you want to live in yourself. Thank you very much. And let's open up, guys. I want you all to sign the petition and become serious friend. Let me unshare my screen and open up um, the chat or sound, however you guys want to do it for Q&A as long as you want to. Super, Enzo. Well, th thanks a lot, first of all, for, for this uh, presentation on, on Tony and uh, gives us also the feeling on how the company is, the, 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 the feeling that you would get when you enter a Tony office. Um, on the questions, I've got quite a number in the chat, so I will first uh, relay some of them in the chat. And then after Ooh, those questions, the please... Chat? I should be able to see those too, right? Yeah. So please oh, feel free go. also to open up and... Uh, ask them directly but let's start with a few that were posed in the chat during the presentation and then we will open up uh, completely to the whole uh, audience um, cool you're gonna you're gonna moderate the questions to me yeah so let me feedback Perfect. the question to you a few yeah. actually are related to uh, consumer and price so one is from peter and i will bundle those two and you can combine those two so yeah. the first one is uh, about the incentive for consumer to buy your product is it because of the mission slave free or is it because of mm. the curious test? Mm. Um, and the link to that also is a question on the price. Um, uh, you pay a premium price on 20, 50 percent on top of the fair trade. And the mm. question of Raymond is how is that determined? How do you uh, find this 20 to 50 percent on top of the fair trade? OK, so one link to consumer and one link to the, the yeah. premium that you totally pay. different questions and totally different answers. Let me uh, <laughs> let me uh, uh, do them both. Uh, one is about, uh, I would say, the, the path. Uh, so what is appealing to the consumer? It's three and we measure those. So there's we have a brand tracker where we measure not just brand awareness, but also issue awareness, for example. And we also then ask them, so what is what is your what is your entry point towards Tony? And it's three. One is uh, the simply the portfolio of great tasting chocolate. So it's the surprising recipes that we come up with. Um, and because I'm convinced that we, we probably aren't the best chocolate in the world. Uh, because there's probably a chocolatier somewhere in the mountains of Switzerland that makes better chocolate. But I would I would tend to debate that we might be the best chocolate on shelf, right? With the amount of recipes and tasting chocolate we have. If you look at the shelves in the Netherlands now, it used to be very boring. And, and now other brands are starting to copy this constant taste innovation that we have shown in the last 15 years. Um, which is great because together we can change the industry. I mean, I like competition because it's not about competition, it's about changing the whole industry. Um, the, the second in that, uh, in that way towards Tony's is our mission indeed. So people that directly hook up to the mission of Tony's. What you often see though, if for example, during the lectures and the, and the talks I give on stage is that consumers come up to me and they say, I always knew about Tony's, I knew about the fact that they were, or you guys were, are sustainable or maybe organic and fair trade, but I had no idea about this story behind the brand. So um, that is interesting. They get to us and sometimes not even know what we're completely about. And then the third one uh, is our communication, our packaging, our look and feel, our, 
are uh, the, the the touch of the paper on the outside of the bars, the bulkiness of the bars, the unequally divided bars. So the whole the whole um, uh, style of Tony's, I would say. So that's three pass, and it's more or less uh, one third, one third, one third uh, divided. Yeah. Now the next question was about the the pricing. What we do is um, uh, we used to always calculate an. A sort of equilibrium. How much more premium can we pay, uh, which is necessary for the farmers to to get towards a living income, uh, and still uh, will is a is a scalable business model to copy for different brands. Because if we go bam full on with one euro premium, then every brand will say, ah, we're we're not doing this, and then we don't create any traction. Uh, and if we would do too little, then it's not in the in the benefit of the farmers at the other end of the value chain. But last year, we slightly made a, a, a change there. We actually started uh, together with Fair Trade and also Oxfam started calculating the living income reference price, which is really the price that we uh, create. Uh, and you can look up uh, the whole reasoning behind it on our website. Um, which really has to do with what price would you need to pay within that five step sourcing principle that we have because raise, a higher price is only one part. That is our uh, obligation, I think, as a industry. But there's also an obligation for the farmer to increase their volumes, for example, their yield on their fields, on their fields, which is very low in Ghana and Ivory Coast compared to, say, South America, for example. And with a bit of different farming practices, they can up their whole yield. So the living income reference price is is how is which what we establish in a calculation together with fair trade. That is hopefully the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thanks, thanks, Enzo. Um, right, thanks. So that was on consumer price. Uh, there is a couple of questions uh, also on uh, more. Let me also let me elaborate for one second on that though. Yeah. Because some people then say, "Don't you outprice yourself? Aren't you expensive?" And I first of all tend to debate. We are not much more expensive. We have bigger bars, right? So the average bar in Holland is 100 grams. Our bars are 180 grams. So it's quickly perceived as more expensive. But if you then go per gram, if you would then still consider Tony's much more expensive, I would say the other ones are too cheap. And the only way you can get that cheap chocolate is by having unpaid forced labor in your value chain. And it showed because once Albert Heijn switched to the five sourcing principles, their Delicata bars, didn't become much more expensive than eight or 10 cents consumer price increase. Mm -hmm. um, and the industry, so the bank in the in the candy industry normally demands about 25 to 30 percent net profit. We have three very clear KPIs. And even though I absolutely hate the word KPI, because I always say that every time you use the word KPI, a puppy dies somewhere in the world. So I'm about to kill my fourth puppy. We have three very clear KPIs. One is a 50% year on year growth, which we maintained until two years ago when we became market leaders in the Netherlands and our international expansion hasn't been able to go that fast that we still maintain 25 or 50% growth, even though we had 26% growth last year, which is still amazing for a company after 15 years, uh, but it was a bit too low in our opinion. The second one is 40% gross margin, which we've managed to maintain even in the last two years. And the third is at least 4% net profit, which is very tight, honestly, compared to the 25 to 30% uh, net profit that the banks want us to make. But it's more than enough for us to please the shareholders, but also maintain a equally divided value chain and a fair price to the farmers in the beginning of the value chain. So that is important to know as well. No, super, thank you, Zoana. I will uh, take, uh, uh, I saw that Liki has posed two questions, so I will take the question of Liki and then I will ask a few participants to just add the question themselves, that we start to have a bit more interaction on it between the two of us. Cool. Uh, so that will be, uh, so I will take the question of Liki and then I will ask a few of you, uh, um, Willem, uh, Raymond, that you will be able to ask your question directly like this, that will generate interaction. So let me take the two questions of Liki there. One is on the um, uh, system in Ghana and Ivory Coast. Uh, how do you actually change the system there? And can you give us some examples on how do you, you do it locally? And yeah. the, the other question of Liki is on the uh, methodology of true price. Do you use that also in your, uh, in your company? Yeah, yeah. Yes and yes. Again, two questions. Smart yeah. move, put two in. Um, the first is systemic change. Um, now, 
I remember the first time I went to Ivory Coast, uh, my good friend and uh, and uh, value chain director, then uh, Arya Buchholz, told me, Inzo, don't expect uh, beautiful white cottages with rose gardens around them with the farmers that we work with now, right? The system is has been so draining and unequal and and so shitty, I would say, that it's it's a level of poverty that you can hardly imagine in in Ivory Coast and Ghana at the farmers that grow these cocoa beans, um, and. What you see is a part that's unmeasurable. So once you start working with these farmers, and it takes a long time to, to actually have this change uh, coming through. But what you see is an increase in pride, an increase in fairness in how quickly they are paid. Um, and, and, and that is important for me. That's a very untangible uh, uh, change. But once you start working with more Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, you need to much more proof of the pudding, so to, see, so to speak. So much more Excel spreadsheet proof to show the change. So what we have is, over the course of the last five years, we started having uh, a certain set of non-financial KPIs, they're back again, uh, that are audited by PricewaterhouseCoopers in our annual report. And I would really encourage you to download it or get one from our stores, uh, a hard copy uh, when they're open again. Uh, that talks about all of these non-financial KPIs, which is, for example, the traceable cocoa beans, uh, the the amount of uh, incidents of child labor that we ran into. So that is the whole auditing part. There's also a system that we're putting in place uh, to, for example, together with Nestle in the International Cocoa Initiative, uh, and we are implemented or have now implemented in all cooperatives and all the farms that we work with, that's called the Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System, which is an important cultural change on the ground as well, because it used to be just fair trade. And what you then saw is that farmers would try to cover up any form of child labor incident that we would run into, because they would be afraid to lose their fair trade certification and therefore their fair trade premium. The change that the Child Labor Monitoring and Remediation System, the CLMRS, makes is that they go around, farmers, local uh, locals go around, the farmers and kids, and interview them constantly. So are you going to school? How the, how's the environment that you work in? What are the circumstances? And they log it into semi-smartphones, I would say, into a system where we can then help them remediate those incidents. And what we want to do is uncover these uh, incidents. So it's a, it's a cultural change on the ground for the farmers to step forward and come up with, listen, I have a problem, help me remediate it. Um, an example is we ran into a couple of kids working on a farm um, that were working there and we asked them what's happening. And they, they told us that their parents had died and that grandma had taken over the farm, but grandma couldn't run the farm without the kids. So we then start speaking to the cooperative. Listen, guys, you need, you guys need to help uh, grandma until the age that the kids can actually personally decide whether they want to take over the farm or not. So that is a form of remediation, but it's also helping deliver them tools. So if there's kids that are old enough, but they are carrying big bags of cocoa beans, we help them with uh, 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 wheelbarrows, buy that for them, et cetera, et cetera. So we find these incidents. There's no incidents in the last two years of modern slavery at the uh, cooperatives that we work with, but we did run into 256 of child labor incidents that we then helped them to remediate. So it's that system, the CLMRS, it's the system of the auditing through Price Waterhouse of also non-financial KPIs, and it's the audits of fair trade, et cetera, that make sure that we have a system that we can see in improvements. But it's hard to measure, I got to tell you. You have a whole impact team that's working day and night on measuring the impact that we make. And we've only been able to put this in place in the last few years. Um, it isn't easy. Yeah. And yeah, I can imagine it for sure. And then the question on true price, do you use true price mm. also to, to have this yes, visibility we work, on so on? on we've on, worked uh, with true price um, and a couple of times, and it's not cheap uh, to have a have a full uh, full uh, a, a true price established. Um, look it up. I don't have the figures top of my head, but it's in our annual report as well. The true price of the bars and how we've increased uh, throughout through the years. 
And I think it's about time for us to do one again. I think the last one was two years ago or something, maybe three years ago. Uh, but again, we're looking at it because in these times, and with the very thin uh, net profit that we made last year, we need to also see uh, uh, how we can still do that. But, I, but I'd love to see another one uh, uh, soon. Okay, so what, no, cool. Yeah, can, can I ask, so what do you uh, do take in, into account when it comes to true price? Um, because yeah, I, I, I can I imagine that the point. whole analysis would be very expensive, uh, yeah. but Just, there are some uh, features in true price which well, you're able to take into account, I think. Yes, but I don't know this top of my head. Look it up in our fair report. It's in there. I know that. Uh, I know the social side is also taking into account there, which we find very, uh, uh, very uh, important as well. Yeah. And about so about yeah. child labor, because uh, well, I work for Rabobank Foundation, uh, so we come across smallholder farmers. Uh, uh, very often, <laughs> yeah. um, and what we see is that there is a very thin line between child labor or helping your parents on the farm. Yes. How do you deal with, uh, uh, do you have a definition of child yes, labor or how do. do you make the change? And once again, I would say, go for it. <laughs> uh, it's a very uh, it's a very thin line. We have a uh, graphic, I'm amazing how fast I found this one, by the way. I'm really, uh, I'm really proud of myself. Um, this is the stat, uh, which is a tough one, but it, it, uh, you are completely right. So there is, it's very hard to find a very strict definition, and it's also a definition that is uh, not given. So, for example, the international, the international cocoa initiative has a different definition than we would have. Uh, different uh, uh, chocolate uh, producers have different definition. For us, it has to do with a certain age level, it has to do with unpaid work, uh, and it has to do with whether it's within family situation or not as well. So those are important factors there, and then there's a there's a, it's a complete uh, uh, chapter in our annual uh, report. But for us, it's, it's any form of uh, illegal forced child labor outside of family situations. It's the shortest definition that I could give you of uh, modern slavery. Good. Thanks, uh, Enzo. Um, I will take, uh, so Linke has, has, has put a comment live. I will take two questions from the chat and then I will ask a few people to come up live as well afterwards. Because there's two questions, one from Peter and one from uh, Ferdat that are, I think, quite connected, which is the influence with your uh, competitor? Do you see change uh, with company in the sector that you are working with following your example? So improvement in sustainability. Um, and is it possible for those existing brands also to follow the principle you are following? Yes, the last part, let me first take the last question then. Yes, that is exactly our point. So we want to form a scalable and copyable business model and that is why we don't make our own chocolate ourselves yet, right? We're opening our factory, but up till now, we've always wanted to show the industry because we always got the, the counter argument, yeah, but you're this small philanthropical uh, club in Amsterdam. And by having this system where we are profitable, where we are financially successful, where we are growing so much per year, where we can show that we're market leader. I mean, for me as a, as a, um, uh, as a uh, uh, economy uh, graduate, uh, I, I have always opposed the constant 20th century definition of capitalism, where it has always to do with uh, growth, right? And I think growth is, in certain situations, ridiculous. I mean, I always use the analogy with my bed. My bed is two meters and 10 long. Why would I care about my bed being two meters 20 long next year and two meters 30 long the year after, at a certain point, it wouldn't fit in my living or in my bedroom anymore. The same thing with capitalism. So, but we, as Tonys, want to grow to show the industry uh, that we're there. One, because if you're noticed, then they'll start copying you. But two, also that within the old system of capitalism, we, you can show this financial success. So that is why we want this scalable, copyable model for all uh, uh, chocolate uh, producers around us. And what was the first part of your question again? 
Yeah, it was actually the it was a bit linked to that as well. It's what's the the improvement that you see in terms of sustainability right. performances in right. other companies. Right. Well, it's hard to hard to pretend or to assume or presume that we would have any influence so far. But if you look at the sustainability programs of other chocolate manufacturers, you see more and more of it. Whether they are enough, I would beg to differ. Whether they are strong enough, I would beg to differ. I am a bit of an activist within my club, even, I would say. And there was a initiative launched or a press release launched a couple of months ago by a couple of big chocolate players that said, yes, bring on legislation. And at the first moment, I thought, hey, that's good news, right? On the, and, but on second thought, I figured, no, this is just another stalling strategy again to ask for legislation, which will probably take two more years or three more years, and for them not to do anything until then, because I think they can take much more responsibility at this point in time already, because we show it is possible. But you see some traction left and right. There are other manufacturers that are indeed uh, paying a premium to their farmers. But let, let me give you a little example, a competitor, I'm, I won't mention any names, that are bragging or no, no, are talking about the premium that they paid and they paid $38 per ton, whilst last year we paid at certain points up to $600 per ton. So that is the to put things in perspective. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, but we are now therefore this, this Tony's open chain platform that we launched is meant for to to actively invite others to join the five sourcing principles that we think are essential to make that change. And by Colabout joining, and this year, hopefully a couple of other big players joining, we think there is traction, but is it enough? At the moment, on the ground in Ivory Coast, there is not enough traction yet, honestly. Can I ask you something about the large corporates and their willingness to work on these social issues? Because I think, uh, because your mission is mainly about slave-free chocolate, um, mm. I, do you feel that the large corporates like Barry Callabout and like Mondelez and like all, all those big companies uh, feel the same way? Or do they, uh, do they have other um, triggers or um, challenges that they need to address? Like, for example, um, sustainable um, production instead of, instead of only focusing yeah, on slave-free chocolate? It's it's uh, it's a it's an and and though it's not and or. So for example, the thing is for us it's a it's a spearhead, right? For us, the child slavery is something that we saw in the beginning that we just think is unacceptable. Period. But around it, there's a much bigger strategy. So for example, the child labor comes from poverty. The poverty comes from the unequal division of value within that value chain. Um, and so, so, and and, but we're also uh, when it comes to CO2 emissions, when it comes to local farming practices, we are very actively involved in that as well. But we have chosen this one spearhead of the of the child labor for us. But there's much more of a strategy around it as a whole. And some some of these uh, chocolate players are taking a broader responsibility. But it, even that responsibility is that enough? What you often hear is anything we would do would mean that we would become more expensive and then we would outprice ourselves. And then we give them a little example of the fact that uh, three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, the cocoa prices completely plummeted. Um, and we saw no change in retail prices towards consumers for a bar of chocolate. So where did that eight billion dollars difference end up. That wasn't in the hands of the farmers. That was in the hands of the chocolate producers. So okay. if they if they then use a reasoning that they would outprice themselves, we would beg to differ. Then they should have reduced the price of the chocolate bars at that time as well. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point actually. Um, and so I've got a, still a couple of questions here coming up. Yeah. Um, uh, Willem, I will keep your question a little bit towards uh, the end of the discussion because it's a very intriguing and challenging questions, but I think in terms of timing, I will keep it a little bit. 
Um, so yes. let me go. Let me go back to a, a question we had. Actually, we, we brainstormed yesterday with the group as well on question we could have for you, and that was a question from Stephanie from yesterday as well. Um, you are becoming, you are growing in terms of sales, in terms of company. Um, so you are getting not to a large business, but a larger business. So how do you safeguard all the uh, the values and the distinctive culture that you uh, present yeah. to us? Uh, it's a very good question uh, because we always say for us it's about team and impact and it's mostly the team that creates the impact so therefore teams or HR uh, again is so very important and it is a challenge when you now have offices in uh, New York, London, uh, Hamburg and Amsterdam um, how do you maintain that culture uh, in that growth? I think first and foremost by having constantly this focus on that team being so important. And that is not just saying, right? Even in these times of Corona crisis, we have online huddles every week and every morning with our specific teams. And we constantly hammer on the fact that whatever happens, the most important is that team. So even our freelancers and our uh, and the people that don't have a full-time contract, we said, no one is now leaving Tony's, right? We make sure of the team first, uh, whether you're a freelancer, full-timer, or part-timer, and then we'll see how we manage to, to fix that. Um, so I say focus on team, and often I get then the question, yeah, but uh, you know, I, I need to make a profit. Uh, and I say, well, as Richard Branson would say, I became happy, I, I, I became successful because I'm happy. I'm not I'm not happy because I'm successful. And he, and I also love his saying, he says, you know, I don't focus on my consumers, I focus on happy employees because happy employees create happy customers. And by having this focus, which isn't money driven, but it's focus driven on team, it's effort, it's about focusing on the team, it's focusing on, focusing on the culture, focusing on the mission. I mean, in the end, uh, work happiness evolves around three pillars. It has to do with uh, your personal purpose or your meaning that's linked to the purpose of the company, which is very clear and crystal clear in our in our company, I think. It has to do with uh, personal relationships. So that is why we have, um, and it might sound stupid, but for us, lunch is an institute, right? Lunch at table with friends and you talk about your job. You don't have a melted cheese in five minutes behind your laptop at Tony's. You take half an hour, an hour to just sit down with people. You have We have constant huddles in the morning now on Teams that has nothing to do with business, but just checking in with each other. How are you doing? How can we help? Um, and it's about your personal progress. How can we help you as a person evolve and become happier within this company? So it's the focus on the team. And if I can get a, if I, if you want to have a link that is slightly linked to money, though, a great example was at a certain point, we were eight people big, and one of us got married in the Alps. Uh, so the whole marriage was in the Alps, and she had invited two other people from the team. And then the rest of the team said, ah, fuck that, we'll go party crash in the Alps. So we drove to the Alps, and we party crashed her marriage, and the next year, Somebody at Tony's, when we were 12 people big, said, hey, but isn't it a tradition that we go skiing? So we created our own non-existing tradition from that moment. And we always, every year, go skiing with the whole team, which was going to be last week when we canceled it, obviously. And then we got a US team. And that was first based in Portland, Oregon. And there's already a bit of snow and mountains in Portland, Oregon. So we asked them, what do you guys want to do? You want to join us in the Alps or are you going to create your own a trip with the whole team and they said we're going to go surfing in San Diego every year so they started the surf trip and they came up with the uh, financial estimate for the surf trip and they sent it over to Hank Young our chief chocolate officer and Hank Young got the got the uh, the calculation and he said approved but only when the budget is doubled right so he made a statement saying oh this is so important for us that you can only do it if you spend more money on it. You know, it, make it big, make it happen. And so our, our trips, our show academies, our quarterly meetings are very tonified and, and has such a focus on getting together as a team and also talking about the values that we have. So it's not just money and figures, sales figures. It's really about the four values that we have and the mission that we have on top of that. So I would say focus on team is, is what makes sure that we 
get to maintain this company culture that we have. Um, and it's making sure that people are happy, uh, happy people within our team. I hate, I absolutely hate the word job satisfaction. So if you work in a company that sends out employee satisfaction surveys, I would say the first thing you do is press delete because satisfaction on a scale of one to 10 isn't much more than a six or a six and a half, right? I mean, it's about happiness that gets you to the 10. The first question that we ask in our, in our biannual surveys is not how happy are you with your job, how happy are you with your uh, team, with your lease car, with your laptop. The first question that we ask is simply, how happy are you, period? And what can we do to help you increase your personal happiness? Because I do, I so do not believe in work-life balance anymore, right? In 2020, everything is intertwined, right? If work-life was a balance, that would mean that at work you're dead, right? Because that is the balance of life. And I think that's ridiculous. So it's all about work happiness and not job satisfaction and bullshit like that. That is my personal former HR uh, opinion. I think that's a very strong statement. So thanks for sharing, Enzo. That's pretty cool, actually. Um, there is one question from Willem, which uh, was one of the first questions I asked, actually. But Willem, can you come online and ask your questions there? I think it's a very interesting question there. Yeah, sure, no problem at all. So thank you much, very much for the uh, insightful lesson so far. Learned a lot, not also not only about chocolate and sustainability, but also how to organize a company. Um, and this question is perhaps a bit too positive, but I wanted to know what would be <laughs> your next target after the company has reached its uh, goal of slavery chocolate, because that will happen, obviously, at some point in time. What will be your next target? Well, it has to happen. Yes. I get this question uh, often, I can tell you. It made me laugh because there's no such thing as a no, as a too positive question. But anyway, um, what will we do next? Honestly, if you look at it, I, I would be happy to become obsolete. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I strongly believe in the volcano of entrepreneurship. And that is how it should be, right? Things should explode at the top for new things to arise again. So maybe in the last decade, we should have let car manufacturers explode in the US and we should let airline businesses explode on the top of the volcano instead of just maintaining them as they are. But that's my personal activist opinion. Um, I am fine becoming obsolete in that sense, but I will be fine becoming obsolete when and only when we have reached our mission. So uh, there's not there's there's still a lot of forced child labor in the fashion industry, in the shipping industry, in the entertainment industry. I would be more than happy to become a fashion brand then and make Tony's onesies. Unfortunately, as you just heard, I, I heard I'm not too fashionable. So we're better at chocolate at the moment than in fashion, I would say. But if you, for example, would then ask me, um, how would you look at being sold to a big corporate, for example? Um, some people have a very strong opinion about that. If you look at this, the sell of the Vegetarische Slager, the vegetarian butcher to Unilever, a lot of people were negative about it. I applaud it because it brings uh, Jaap uh, of the Vegetarian Slager closer to his mission of not eating meat. Uh, and I'm fine with that. So if we were to be sold to a big corporate, I would be fine with that if that would mean us reaching our mission of 100% slave-free chocolate sooner. So therefore, becoming this, this green gangrene of change within a big corporate, making sure that they change their value chains by purchasing Tony's Chocoloni as a company. Um, but that's my opinion. So, so there's, there's a lot of shit to change in the world. And the funny thing is, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, uh, master in e economy, and, and I often speak to students, or for example, the other day I had a Rabo uh, trainees uh, I spoke to, they can just not understand or get their head around us uh, being happy to make ourselves obsolete. And I then say, you know, our USP is that we want to get rid of the you in our USP. We don't want to be unique in what we're doing. We don't want everybody to do what we're doing and then we'll do something else. But until then, we're highly competitive and highly commercial. Uh, and so on, on this, I think I, w I will follow a question uh, of Stephanie, because I think what you explain also may be due to that. W what is the ownership structure of Tony right now? Mm. Yes, that has recently changed. Um, <laughs> but up till now, you have a couple of very clear shareholders. 
So that is uh, uh, Maurice Deckers, who is the um, uh, owner of the production company of Curiosities van Waarde, the television show that I spoke about that launched us. And uh, people often think that Teun van der Keuken, the journalist, is one of them, but he isn't. He was the, the face, the journalist of the program. And the owner of the program was one of the biggest shareholders first. Uh, then there's somebody who used to run the company with a big uh, share of stocks, but Hank Jan Beltman, the chief chocolate officer, first bought the minority share in Tony's and then the majority share in Tony's. And recently we sold a big chunk to an investment company uh, to be able to finance the international expansion and the uh, building of the factory in Amsterdam. And then the most important for me, is the rest of the of all Tonys because together we form about 30% of all uh, shares that is owned by the employees in Tonys. And okay. some other people, like a couple of journalists from the program and the exporter that we work with in Ivory Coast, etc. And perhaps a related question from Stephanie there is that you mentioned that you, you attracted funding or investment from an external investor, but do you think also this traditional shareholders would be open to, to the type of business you are currently uh, uh, developing? At least for one of them, yes, because you got investment, but more generally? What you mean outside of Tony's? Yeah, it's an okay. external investor. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, but, but I'm really being a bedroom activist at the moment, as you see. Uh, un un unfortunately, a lot of uh, modern day investors uh, have a very, very short-term focus. So a lot of uh, uh, um, companies that have investors say, yeah, but I need, to, uh, I need to please my shareholders. And I can understand their struggles, but at the same time, maybe as entrepreneurs and as companies, we have the obligation to educate our investors as well that times they are a changing and we have a longer-term focus there. Everybody needs to be part of a change in that system. Um, and um, and I think at this point in time, there isn't a clearer moment to see that we need to perhaps use this crisis to change that system from within. So is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Is it hard? Yes, it is hard. Uh, do we all need to change? Yes. Is it hard? And do investors have a more and more shorter term focus over the last 20 or 30 years, you see this, this in and out uh, time span having become much shorter for investors, and maybe they need to extend that again, and have a longer term focus towards a better planet and better society around them. Because what is shareholder value gonna do to, for you if we fuck up this planet within a couple of generations? Yeah, close to zero, I suppose, but th th that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, perhaps uh, we have time for a couple of more questions before we wrap up, but. One on the factory that you are building in, in Amsterdam, uh, Enzo. Uh, what was the key reason for you to build this factory? Because right now you have a partner that makes the chocolate for you. Um, what was the rationale to do this? Because it's quite an investment. You needed external investment to do this. So it was quite a, a, a choice in a strategy to do so. Yeah, we have, uh, trust me, any decision within Tony's is also the beginning of a, a broad democratic uh, discussion on this. So we still have also sometimes the critical discussion about the factory, obviously, um, because it's a big thing, you know, it's a, for a company that does uh, 70 million euros revenue uh, with uh, uh, last year, we jokingly say zero profit, 100% impact. Uh, but honestly, we made 2,600 euros profit last year and we managed to drink that away in one evening as a team. Um, it is a big investment to do more than 100 million investment into a factory, and I fully recognize that. But we see it as an essential part and really the first step in that strategy pyramid that I talked about, which is about creating awareness. This is really to create much more awareness amongst consumers about the bitter reality in the cocoa industry. We really want to have some sort of huge exhibition of how does that look, that value chain, because it's such an intransparent thing. And to have this factory with a whole experience and literally cocoa, bean, uh, cocoa trees that will grow there in, in, a, in a, uh, a greenhouse environment and showing how chocolate is made, we can ed educate many more consumers about this reality in the cocoa industry. It needs to really be an experience, a circus, a Disneyland of chocolate uh, where people will talk about worldwide. 
Uh, and it, it is also a A, but that's only part of it, way for us to really directly make chocolate and show, uh, and for us to have a, a factory to work with making chocolate. Uh, but it, and it's also, a part of it is also a crazy childhood dream by our chief chocolate officer that, that has always wanted to, to have this factory to show how this is made and, and making us less dependent on those partners, even though we will still be working with partners externally as well. And also one of the partners in our factory is Calabal as a chocolate uh, producer. Okay, so that closed the loop then. Okay, very good. Uh, I, I made the last call for questions, uh, Enzo, and it seems that we are drying up the questions now. Uh, we are also almost uh, on, on uh, the middle of the hour, so it, I think it's time to wrap up as well. Um, there's, uh, a, there's a good, I saw Raymond has a question here. What are your views? Oh, yeah, it's on Raymond. Indeed, indeed. Indeed. The 400 differential. Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah it's, it's Raymond here. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, just, it's, a great, it's a great question, Raymond, um, uh, that I just, you, you want to repeat it for the rest or has the rest seen it? No, I can repeat it. So the Ghana and Ivory Coast together uh, introduced what they call a living income differential, which basically yeah. uh, indicates that the cocoa price will go up by $400 a ton, which should yeah. go to uh, to the farmers to uh, yeah. to improve their uh, their living income. Uh, should go. I'm just yeah. I, I'm uh, I'm I'm a banker at ABN Amro. We bank a lot of the the, the traders, including Callabout. And we have yeah. a lot of discussions with our clients around this as well. Uh, yeah. So I want, I just wanted to understand from your side, how do you view this? Do you see this yeah. as a, as a, as a good start, or yeah. do you see this as a uh, political instrument uh, while uh, elections are coming up? Ah, the last one is a good question. Um, honestly, one, first of all, I'm a very simple man, and I'm a very activist entrepreneur. So the first moment I heard this, and this is uh, for the last, for ages I've been saying, why, why, doesn't, why don't do these two countries form, or other cocoa producing companies form a COPAC, right? Uh, the OPAC of co co cocoa. Uh, and then my impact team often pulled me back saying, Enzo, we wish it was that simple. Because oil can be very easily uh, funneled, right? Whilst cocoa can leave a country f from thousand parts of the border, and it's impossible to form a copac. And then this happened, right? Ghana and Ivory Coast together said, you know, uh, you guys need to start paying uh, a fairer price for the cocoa beans. And I applauded it. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the buyers on the other end, uh, the big players, in the end said, no, you know, no, we're not going to abide by this. And we have enough stock in Amsterdam uh, Harbor. Well, they didn't say the last part, but we have enough stock to outdo your uh, your your price pressure that you're putting on us now. Uh, and I, I see it as a potentially very good move for for joining hands between the two biggest cocoa producing countries in the world mm -hmm. um, to show that something needs to change. Um, it's still, uh, well, it's first of all, the, 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 the bigger buyers don't want to abide. So it's still in progress, I would say. But we have now taken the step of showing uh, the rest of the industry that you need to. That's why this was for us to push towards that living income reference price that we established um, that we think everybody should be uh, abiding by. But it's still work in progress, honestly. Um, but I think it was a good move initially by these uh, uh, by the countries to 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 put this in place. That's my personal opinion about this, huh? But it's a very, I mean, it isn't as easy as, as I make it sound now. No. No. And then, right, thanks. And, and, and then Raymond, very important, is the last part of, of what you said in your question as well. We have the same thing. Yes, great move by these governments, but we need to really keep a sharp eye on that premium then really getting to the farmers, which is the most essential yeah. part, right? And that is not a given yet in these countries. No, fantastic. No, I agree. And so um, I would like to wrap up the session and thank you. But by doing so, I would like to tell you a little bit about the underlying principle of our course here. Um, we do a class on sustainability. And the underlying principle is that the most important work of today is highly systemic and deeply personal. And 
today you just showed us exactly that. Uh, you had the example of the mission of Tony, which is highly systemic and the systemic change that you want to do. But by the energy that you brought, which I felt again, even online, so I can guarantee you it works, it's deeply personal. So um, thank you very much for that. I was looking for a way to give you an, a round of applause. I will find a way <laughs> later on in Teams. Uh, so far, I haven't figured out, but uh, for sure, thank you very much for being with us today, for sharing all those insights from Tony. We will. We have a new session early June, obviously, of hopefully face to face with the participant, and we will dive again in Tony. So there, I promise the team to bring real chocolate, and of course, I will bring Tony chocolate to the team. So. We'll make this some thank you, uh, thank you very friend. much, all of you, for having me. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining. Uh, and I will. I wish you all seriously health and safety. And I wish for all of us uh, entrepreneurs to. Uh, at the moment, we can't join hands officially uh, because of uh, medical reasons, but let, let's at least show the world that we can join our hearts and make a difference not just in our close environment within our families, but also a slightly bigger environment in your societies and just the block of people around you as well. So uh, be part of that change, all of you. That will be the last one. Thank you very Thank much, you very Enzo. Much. Yeah. Thank you very and much, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.